Bahá'u'lláh, Arabic, Ba'al the 12th of November 1817 to the 29th of May 1892, was a Persian religious leader and the founder of the Bahá'í Faith, which advocates universal peace and unity among all races, nations, and religions. At the age of 27, Bahá'u'lláh became a follower of the Bab, a Persian merchant who began preaching that God would soon send a new prophet similar to Jesus or Muhammad. The Bab and thousands of followers were executed by the Iranian authorities for their beliefs. Bahá'u'lláh faced exile from his native Iran, and in Baghdad in 1863 claimed to be the expected prophet of whom the Bab foretold. Thus, Bahá'ís regard Bahá'u'lláh to be a manifestation of God, fulfilling of the eschatological expectations of Islam, Christianity, and other major religions. Bahá'u'lláh faced further imprisonment under Ottoman authorities, initially in Edirne, and ultimately to the prison city of Acre, present-day Israel, where he spent his final 24 years of life. His burial place is a destination of pilgrimage for his followers, and the Bahá'í World Center sits in nearby Haifa. He wrote many religious works, notably the Kitab i Akdas, the Kitab i Ikon, the Seven Valleys, and the Hidden Words. Bahá'u'lláh's teachings focus on the unity of God, religion, and mankind. Similar to other monotheistic religions, God is considered the source of all created things. Religion, according to Bahá'u'lláh, is renewed periodically by manifestations of God, people who are made perfect through divine intervention and whose teachings are the sources of the major world religions throughout history. Bahá'ís view Bahá'u'lláh as the first of these teachers whose mission includes the spiritual unification of the entire planet through the eradication of racism and nationalism. Bahá'u'lláh's teachings include the need for a world tribunal to adjudicate disputes between nations, a uniform system of weights and measures, and an auxiliary language that could be spoken by all the people on earth. Bahá'u'lláh also taught that the cycles of revelatory renewal will continue in the future, with manifestations of God appearing about every thousand years. Early and family life Bahá'u'lláh was born Mirza Husayn Ali Nuri Persian, Mirza Sinli Nuri on 12 November 1817 in Tehran, the capital of Persia, present-day Iran. Bahá'í authors trace his ancestry back to Abraham through Abraham's wife Keturah, to Zoroaster, to Yazgird III, the last king of the Sassanid Empire, and also to Jesse. According to the Bahá'í author John Abel, Bahá'ís also consider Bahá'u'lláh to have been "...descended doubly, from both Abraham and Sarah, and separately from Abraham and Keturah." His mother was Khadiji Kanem and his father was Mirza Bazurg. Bahá'u'lláh's father served as vizier to Imam Verdi Mirza, the twelfth son of Fat Ali Shah Qajar. Mirza Bazurg was later appointed governor of Burajird and Loristan, a position that he was stripped of during a government purge when Muhammad Shah came to power. After the death of his father, Bahá'u'lláh was asked to take a government post by the new vizier Haji Mirza Akazi, but declined. Bahá'u'lláh had three wives. He married his first wife Asiyi Kanem, the daughter of a nobleman, in Tehran in 1835, when he was 18 and she was 15. She was given the title of the most exalted leaf in Navab. His second wife was his widowed cousin Fatima Kanem. The marriage took place in Tehran in 1849 when she was 21 and he was 32. She was known as Mahdi Yulia. His third wife was Ghaffar Kanem, and the marriage occurred in Baghdad sometime before 1863. He had 14 children, four daughters, and ten sons, five of whom he outlived. Bahá'ís regard Asiyi Kanem and her children Mirza Midi, Bahá'í Kanem, and Abdul Baha to be the Bahá'í Holy Family. <laughs> Babi movement In 1844, a 24-year-old man from Shiraz, Sayyid Mirza Ali Muhammad, claimed to be the promised redeemer or Mahdi and Qaim of Islam, taking the title of the Bab, or the Gate. The resulting Babi movement quickly spread across the Persian Empire, attracting widespread opposition from the Islamic clergy. The Bab himself was executed in 1850 by a firing squad in the public square of Tabriz at the age of 30. The Bab claimed no finality for his revelation. In his writings, he alluded to a promised one, most commonly referred to as, Him whom God shall make manifest. According to the Bab, this personage, promised in the sacred writings of previous religions, would establish the kingdom of God on the earth. Several of the Bab's writings state the coming of him whom God shall make manifest would be imminent. 
The Bab constantly entreats his believers to follow him whom God shall make manifest when he arrives. The Bab also eliminated the institution of successorship or vicegerency to his movement, and stated that no other person's writings would be binding after his death until him whom God shall make manifest had appeared. Topic. Acceptance of the Bab Baha'u'llah first heard of the Bab when he was 27, and received a visitor sent by the Bab, Mullah Hussain, telling him of the Bab and his claims. Baha'u'llah became a Babi and helped to spread the new movement, especially in his native province of Nur, where he became recognized as one of its most influential believers. His notability as a local gave him many openings, and his trips to teach the religion were met with success, even among some of the religious class. He also helped to protect fellow believers, such as Tahira, for which he was temporarily imprisoned in Tehran and punished with bastinado or foot whipping. Baha'u'llah, in the summer of 1848, also attended the Conference of Badasht in the province of Khorasan, where 81 prominent Babis met for 22 days, at that conference where there was a discussion between those Babis who wanted to maintain Islamic law and those who believed that the Bab's message began a new dispensation, Baha'u'llah took the pro-change side, which eventually won out. It is at this conference that Baha'u'llah took on the name Baha. When violence started between the Babis and the Qajar government in the later part of 1848, Baha'u'llah tried to reach the besieged Babis at the Sheikh Tabarsi in Mazandaran, but was arrested and imprisoned before he could get there. The following years until 1850 saw the Babis being massacred in various provinces after the Bab publicly made his claim of being the manifestation of God. After the Bab was executed in 1850, a group of Tehran Babis, headed by a Babi known as Azim, who was previously a shaky cleric, plotted an assassination plan against the Shah Nasser al-Din Shah, in retaliation for the Bab's execution. Baha'u'llah condemned the plan, however, any moderating influence that he may have had was diminished in June 1851 when he went into exile to Baghdad at the chief minister's request, returning only after Amir Kabir's fall from power. On 15 August 1852, the radical group of Babis attempted the assassination of the Shah and failed. The group of Babis linked with the plan, were rounded up and executed, but notwithstanding the assassins' claim that they were working alone, the entire Babi community was blamed, precipitating violent riots against the Babi community that were encouraged and orchestrated by the government. During this time many Babis were killed, and many more, including Baha'u'llah, were imprisoned in the Saya Chow, Black Pit. An underground dungeon of Tehran, according to Baha'u'llah, it was during his imprisonment in the Saya Chal that he had several mystical experiences, and received a vision of a maiden from God, through whom he received his mission as a messenger of God and as the one whose coming the Bab had prophesied. The confession of the would-be assassin had exonerated the Babi leaders, and in the context of the continuing mass executions of Babis, the ambassador of Russia requested that Baha'u'llah and other persons apparently unconnected with the conspiracy be spared. After he had been in the Saya Chal for four months Baha'u'llah was in fact finally released, on condition he left Iran. Declining an offer of refugee status in Russia, he chose exile in Iraq then part of the Ottoman Empire. In 1853 Baha'u'llah and his family, accompanied by a member of the Shah's bodyguard and a representative of the Russian embassy, traveled from Persia, arriving in Baghdad on 8 April 1853. Baghdad. <inaudible> <inaudible> The Bab had appointed Mirza Yahya later known as, Subai Azal as the leader after himself. Mirza Yahya had gone into hiding after the assassination attempt on the Shah, and after Baha'u'llah's exile to Baghdad, he chose to join his brother there. At the same time, an increasing number of Babis considered Baghdad the new center for leadership of the Babi religion, and a flow of pilgrims started going there from Persia. Mirza Yahya's leadership was controversial. He generally absented himself from the Babi community, spending his time in Baghdad in hiding and disguise. On several occasions, he went so far as to publicly disavow allegiance to the Bab. Mirza Yahya gradually alienated himself from a large number of the Babis, who started giving their allegiance to other claimants. During the time that Mirza Yahya remained in hiding, Baha'u'llah performed much of the daily administration of Babi affairs. 
In contrast to Mirza Yahya, Bahá'u'lláh was outgoing and accessible and he was seen by an increasing number of Babis as a religious leader, rather than just an organizer, and became their center of devotion. This was increasingly resented by Mirza Yahya, who began trying to discredit Bahá'u'lláh, thus driving many people away from the religion. Tensions in the community mounted, and in 1854 Bahá'u'lláh decided to leave the city to pursue a solitary life. Kurdistan. On 10 April 1854, without telling anyone of his intention or destination, Bahá'u'lláh left his family to the care of his brother Mirza Musa and travelled with one companion to the mountains of Kurdistan, northeast of Baghdad, near the city of Sulaymaniyya. He later wrote that he left so as to avoid becoming a source of disagreement within the Babi community, and that his withdrawal contemplated no return. For two years, Bahá'u'lláh lived alone in the mountains of Kurdistan. He originally lived as a hermit, dressed like a dervish and used the name Darvish Muhammad i Irani. At one point someone noticed his penmanship, which brought the curiosity of the instructors of the local Sufi orders. As he began to take guests, he became noted for his learning and wisdom. Sheikh' Uthman, Sheikh' Abdur Rahman, and Sheikh Ismail, leaders of the Naqshbandiyya, Qadiriyya, and Khalidiyya orders respectively, began to seek his advice. It was to the second of these that the Four Valleys was written. Bahá'u'lláh wrote several other notable books during this time. In Baghdad, given the lack of firm and public leadership by Mirza Yahya, the Babi community had fallen into disarray. Some Babis, including Bahá'u'lláh's family, began searching for Bahá'u'lláh, and when news of a man living in the mountains under the name of Darvish Muhammad spread to neighboring areas, Bahá'u'lláh's family begged him to come back to Baghdad. On 19 March 1856, after two years in Kurdistan he returned to Baghdad. Topic. Return to Baghdad When Bahá'u'lláh returned to Baghdad he saw that the Babi community had become disheartened and divided. During Bahá'u'lláh's absence, it had become alienated from the religion because Mirza Yahya had continued his policy of militancy and had been unable to provide effective leadership. Mirza Yahya had married the widow of the Bab against the Bab's clear instructions, dispatched followers to the province of Nur for the second attempt on the life of the Shah, and instigated violence against prominent Babis who had challenged his leadership. After his return to Baghdad, Bahá'u'lláh tried to revive the Babi community, mostly through correspondence, writing extensively to give the Babis a new understanding of the Babi religion, while keeping his perceived station as the one promised by the Bab and a manifestation of God hidden. He was soon recognized by the Babis, as well as government authorities, as the foremost Babi leader, and there was a growing number of people joining the Babi movement. He also gained sympathy from government officials and Sunni clerics. Bahá'u'lláh's rising influence in the city, and the revival of the Persian Babi community, gained the attention of his enemies in Islamic clergy and the Persian government. The Persian government asked the Ottoman government to extradite Bahá'u'lláh to Persia, but the Ottoman government refused and instead chose to move Bahá'u'lláh from the sensitive border region to Constantinople. <laughs> <laughs> Declaration in the Garden of Ridvan On 21 April 1863, Bahá'u'lláh left Baghdad and entered the Najibiyya Gardens, now the location of Baghdad Medical City and known to Bahá'ís as the Garden of Ridvan. Bahá'u'lláh and those accompanying him stayed in the garden for twelve days before departing for Constantinople. It was during this time that Bahá'u'lláh declared to a small group of his companions his perceived mission and station as a messenger of God. Bahá'u'lláh declared himself he whom God shall make manifest, a messianic figure in the religion of Babism. Bahá'u'lláh based this announcement on an experience he had previously while imprisoned in the Sayachal in Tehran where he is said to have had a vision of the Maid of Heaven. Bahá'ís regard this period with great significance and celebrate the twelve days that Bahá'u'lláh spent in this garden as the festival of Ridvan. He referred to the period of messianic secrecy between when he claimed to have seen the Maiden of Heaven in the Saya Chal and his declaration as the Ami Bhutan days of concealment. Bahá'u'lláh stated that this period was a set time of concealment. The declaration in the Garden of Ridvan was the beginning of a new phase in the Babi community which led to the emergence of the Bahá'í Faith as a distinctive movement separate from Babism. Imprisonment. <inaudible> <inaudible> Bahá'u'lláh was given an order to relocate to the Ottoman capital of Constantinople. 
Although not a formal prisoner yet, the forced exile from Baghdad was the beginning of a long process which would gradually move him into further exiles and eventually to the penal colony of Acre, Palestine now in Israel. Constantinople Bahá'u'lláh travelled from Baghdad to Constantinople between 3 May and 17 August 1863, accompanied by a large group including family members and followers. During the trip, he was treated with respect in the towns he visited, and when he reached Constantinople, he was treated as a government guest. Why the Ottoman authorities did not permit his extradition to Persia, but instead invited him to come to Constantinople, is unclear. The reason may have been political because Bahá'u'lláh was viewed as a person of influence. After three and a half months in Constantinople, he was ordered to depart for Adrianople. The reason for this further move is also unclear. It may have been due to pressure from the Persian ambassador, combined with Bahá'u'lláh's refusal to work with the Ottoman authorities. Adrianople From 1 to 12 December 1863, Bahá'u'lláh and his family travelled to Adrianople. Unlike his travel to Constantinople, this journey was in the nature of an exile. Bahá'u'lláh stayed in Adrianople for four and a half years, and was the clear leader of the newly established Babi community there. Bahá'u'lláh's growing preeminence in the Babi community and in the city at large led to a final breach between Bahá'u'lláh and Mirza Yahya. In 1865, Mirza Yahya was accused of plotting to kill Bahá'u'lláh. In contemporary accounts, Mirza Yahya is reported to have tried to have Bahá'u'lláh assassinated by a local barber. The barber, Muhammad Ali of Isfahan, apparently refused and spread word of the danger around the community. Bahá'u'lláh is reported to have counseled, "...on all patience, quietude and gentleness." This pattern was repeated when, according to the personal account of Ostad Muhammad Ali I Salmani, Mirza Yahya attempted to persuade him likewise to murder Bahá'u'lláh in the bath. Eventually Mirza Yahya attempted to poison Bahá'u'lláh, an act that left him gravely ill for a time, and left him with a shaking hand for the rest of his life. After this event in 1866, Bahá'u'lláh made his claim to be he whom God shall make manifest public, as well as making a formal written announcement to Mirza Yahya referring to his followers for the first time as the people of Baha. After his public announcement, Bahá'u'lláh secluded himself in his house and instructed the Babas to choose between himself and Mirza Yahya. Bahá'u'lláh's claims threatened Mirza Yahya's position as leader of the religion since it would mean little to be leader of the Babas if him whom God shall make manifest were to appear and start a new religion. Mirza Yahya responded by making his own claims, but his attempt to preserve the traditional Babism was largely unpopular, and his followers became the minority. In 1867, Mirza Yahya challenged Bahá'u'lláh to a test of the divine will in a local mosque in Adrianople, such that, God would strike down the impostor. Bahá'u'lláh agreed, and went to the Sultan Selim Mosque at the appointed time, but Mirza Yahya lost credibility when he failed to show up. Eventually Bahá'u'lláh was recognized by the vast majority of Babas as, "...he whom God shall make manifest," and his followers began calling themselves Bahá'ís. <laughs> Writings and letters to the leaders of the world During his time in Adrianople, Bahá'u'lláh wrote a great deal. One of the main themes during this time was the proclamation of his claimed mission. He instructed some of his followers to take his claims to Babas in Iran and Iraq who had not heard of his statements, as well as asking the Bahá'ís to be united and detached from the world. He also started to write about distinctive Bahá'í beliefs and practices. Also, while in Adrianople, Bahá'u'lláh proclaimed the Bahá'í Faith further by addressing tablets to the kings and rulers of the world asking them to accept his revelation, renounce their material possessions, work together to settle disputes, and endeavor toward the betterment of the world and its peoples. His first letter was sent to Sultan Abdulaziz of the Ottoman Empire and his ministers, which was followed by the Tablet of the Kings which was a general address to all rulers. In that latter letter the rulers of the earth were asked to listen to Bahá'u'lláh's call, and cast away their material possessions, and since they were given the reins of government that they should rule with justice and protect the rights of the downtrodden. He also told the rulers to reduce their armaments and reconcile their differences. The Christian monarchs were also asked to be faithful to Jesus' call to follow the promised spirit of truth. Later when Bahá'u'lláh was in Acre, he continued writing letters to the leaders of the world including 
Pope Pius IX Napoleon III, Emperor of France Alexander II, Tsar of Russia Wilhelm I, King in Prussia Queen Victoria, Queen of Great Britain and Ireland Franz Joseph, Emperor of Austria-Hungary Sultan Abdul Aziz of the Ottoman Empire Nasiri Din Shah of the Persian Empire Rulers of America and the Presidents of the Republics therein Topic. Acre With the Babi community now irrevocably divided, the followers of Mirza Yahya tried to discredit Baha'u'llah to the Ottoman authorities, accusing him of causing agitation against the government. While an investigation cleared Baha'u'llah, it did bring to the attention of the government that Baha'u'llah and Mirza Yahya were propagating religious claims, and, fearing that this might cause future disorder, they decided to again exile the Babi leaders. A royal command was issued in July 1868 condemning the Babis to perpetual imprisonment and isolation in far-flung outposts of the Ottoman Empire — Famagusta, Cyprus for Mirza Yahya and his followers, and Acre, in Ottoman Palestine, for Baha'u'llah and his followers, the Baha'is, including Baha'u'llah and his family, left Adrianople on 12 August 1868, and, after a journey by land and sea through Gallipoli and Egypt, arrived in Acre on 31 August and were confined in the barracks of the city's citadel. The inhabitants of Acre were told that the new prisoners were enemies of the state, of God and his religion, and that association with them was strictly forbidden. The first years in Acre imposed very harsh conditions with many becoming sick, and eventually three Baha'is dying. Dr. Thomas Chaplin, director of a British hospital in Jerusalem visited Baha'u'llah in April 1871 and sent a letter to the editor printed in the Times in October. This seems to be the first extended commentary on Baha'u'llah in Western newspapers. It was also a very trying time for Baha'u'llah, whose son, Mirza Midi, died in June 1870 at the age of 22 when he fell through a skylight while pacing back and forth in prayer and meditation. After some time, relations between the prisoners and officials and the local community improved, so that the conditions of the imprisonment were eased and eventually, after the Sultan's death, Baha'u'llah was allowed to leave the city and visit nearby places. From 1877 until 1879 Baha'u'llah lived in the house of Mazra'ah. <inaudible> final years The final years of Baha'u'llah's life 1879 were spent in the mansion of Baja, just outside Acre, even though he was still formally a prisoner of the Ottoman Empire. During his years in Acre and Baja, since backquote Abdul Baha, his eldest son, had taken care of the organizational work, Baha'u'llah was able to devote his time to writing, and he produced many volumes of work including the Kitab i Akhdas, his Book of Laws. His other works included letters outlining his vision for a united world, as well as the need for ethical action. He also composed many prayers. In 1890, the Cambridge Orientalist Edward Granville Brown had an interview with Baha'u'llah in this house. After this meeting he wrote his famous pen portrait of Baha'u'llah. In the corner where the divan met the wall sat a wondrous and venerable figure, crowned with a felt head dress of the kind called Taj by dervishes but of unusual height and make, round the base of which was wound a small white turban. The face of him on whom I gazed I can never forget, though I cannot describe it. Those piercing eyes seemed to read one's very soul, power and authority sat on that ample brow, while the deep lines on the forehead and face implied an age which the jet black hair and beard flowing down in indistinguishable luxuriance almost to the waist seemed to belie. No need to ask in whose presence I stood, as I bowed myself before one who is the object of a devotion and love which kings might envy and emperors cipher in vain. On 9 May 1892, Baha'u'llah contracted a slight fever which grew steadily over the following days, abated, and then finally resulted in his death on 29 May 1892 dual two, He was buried in the shrine located next to the mansion of Baja. <laughs> Claims Baha'u'llah stated that he was a messenger of God, and he used the term manifestation of God to define the concept of an intermediary between humanity and God. In the Baha'i writings, the manifestations of God are a series of interrelated personages who speak with a divine voice and who reflect the attributes of the divine into the human world for the progress and advancement of human morals and civilization. 
The manifestations of God, as explained by Baha'u'llah, are not incarnations of God, but have a two-fold station, one which is the divine in that they reveal God's attributes, but not God's essence, and one which is human in that they represent the physical qualities of common man, and have human limitations. Baha'u'llah wrote that God will never manifest his essence into the world. In Baha'u'llah's writings, he writes in many styles, including cases where he speaks as if he was instructed by God to bring a message, in other cases, he writes as though he is speaking as God directly. Some have interpreted Baha'u'llah's writing style to conclude that Baha'u'llah had claimed divinity. Baha'u'llah, however, states himself that the essence of God will never descend into the human world. Statements where Baha'u'llah speaks with the voice of God are meant that he is not actually God, but that he is speaking with the attributes of God. Baha'u'llah declared, as the most recent manifestation of God, that he was the promised one of all religions, fulfilling the messianic prophecies found in world religions. He stated that his claims to being several messiahs converging in one person were the symbolic, rather than literal, fulfillment of the messianic and eschatological prophecies found in the literature of the major religions. Baha'u'llah's eschatological claims constitute six distinctive messianic identifications, from Judaism, the incarnation of the everlasting Father, from the Yuletide prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6, the Lord of hosts, from Christianity, the Spirit of truth, or comforter predicted by Jesus in his farewell discourse of John chapters 14 to 17 and the return of Christ, in the glory of the Father. From Zoroastrianism, the return of Shah Baram Varjavand, a Zoroastrian messiah predicted in various late Pahlavi texts, from Shia Islam the return of the third Imam, Imam Hussein, from Sunni Islam, the return of Jesus, Isa, and from Babism, he whom God shall make manifest. While Baha'u'llah did not himself directly claim to be either the Hindu or Buddhist messiah, he did so in principle through his writings. Later, Abdul Baha stated that Baha'u'llah was the Kalki avatar, who in the classical Hindu Vaishnavas tradition is the tenth and final avatar great incarnation of Vishnu who will come to end the age of darkness and destruction. Baha'is also believe that Baha'u'llah is the fulfillment of the prophecy of appearance of the Maitreya Buddha, who is a future Buddha who will eventually appear on earth, achieve complete enlightenment, and teach the pure Dharma. Baha'is believe that the prophecy that Maitreya will usher in a new society of tolerance and love has been fulfilled by Baha'u'llah's teachings on world peace. Baha'u'llah is believed to be a descendant of a long line of kings in Persia through Yazgird III, the last monarch of the Sasanian dynasty. He also asserted to be a descendant of Abraham through his third wife Keturah. Topic. Succession After Baha'u'llah died on 29 May 1892, the will and testament of Baha'u'llah named his son Abdul Baha as center of the covenant, successor and interpreter of Baha'u'llah's writings, and the appointment was readily accepted by almost all Baha'is, since the appointment was written and unambiguous, and Abdul Baha had proved himself a capable and devoted assistant. However, the appointment given to Abdul Baha was a cause of jealousy within Baha'u'llah's family. Baha'u'llah had also stated that another one of his sons Mirza Muhammad Ali was to be subordinate and second in rank after Abdul Baha. Mirza Muhammad Ali, however, insisted that Abdul Baha was exceeding his powers, and started a rebellion, at first covert, and then public to discredit Abdul Baha. Mirza Muhammad Ali's actions, however, were rejected by the majority of the Baha'is. Due to this conflict, Abdul Baha later excommunicated his brother as a covenant breaker. The conflict was not long lived. After being alienated by the Baha'i community, Muhammad Ali died in 1937 with a handful of followers. Works <laughs> Baha'u'llah wrote many books, tablets, and prayers, of which only a fraction have been translated into English. There have been 15,000 works written by him identified, many of these are in the form of short letters, or tablets, to Baha'is, but he also wrote larger pieces including the Book of Certitude, the Hidden Words and the Gems of Divine Mysteries. The total volume of his works are more than 70 times the size of the Quran and more than 15 times the size of the combined Old and New Testaments of the Bible. The books and letters written by Baha'u'llah cover religious doctrine, the proclamation of his claims, social and moral teachings, as well as Baha'i laws. He also wrote many prayers. 
Jinab i Fadil i Mazindarani, analyzing Baha'u'llah's writings, states that he wrote in the different styles or categories including the interpretation of religious scripture, the enunciation of laws and ordinances, mystical writings, writings about government and world order, including letters to the kings and rulers of the world, writings about knowledge, philosophy, medicine, and alchemy, writings calling for education, good character and virtues, and writing about social teachings. All of his works are considered by Baha'is to be revelation, even those that were written before his announcement of his prophetic claim. Some of his better-known works that have been translated into English include Gleanings, The Hidden Words, the Kitab-i-Akhdas and the Kitab-i-Ikon. Photographs and imagery There are two known photographs of Baha'u'llah, both taken at the same occasion in 1868 while he was in Adrianople present-day Edirne. The one where he looks at the camera was taken for passport purposes and is reproduced in William Miller's book on the Baha'i Faith. Copies of both pictures are at the Baha'i World Center, and one is on display in the International Archives Building, where the Baha'is view it as part of an organized pilgrimage. Outside of this experience Baha'is prefer not to view his photos in public, or even to display any of them in their private homes, and Baha'i institution strongly suggests to use an image of Baha'u'llah's burial shrine instead. Baha'u'llah's image is not in itself offensive to Baha'is. However, Baha'is are expected to treat the image of any manifestation of God with extreme reverence. According to this practice, they avoid depictions of Jesus or of Muhammad, and refrain from portraying any of them in plays and drama. Copies of the photographs are displayed on highly significant occasions, such as six conferences held in October 1967 commemorating the 100th anniversary of Baha'u'llah's writing of the Suri'i Mulak tablet to the kings, which Shoghi Effendi describes as the most momentous tablet revealed by Baha'u'llah. After a meeting in Adrianople, the hands of the cause traveled to the conferences each bearing the precious trust of a photograph of the Blessed Beauty Baha'u'llah, which it will be the privilege of those attending the conferences to view." The official Baha'i position on displaying the photograph of Baha'u'llah is There is no objection that the believers look at the picture of Baha'u'llah, but they should do so with the utmost reverence, and should also not allow that it be exposed openly to the public, even in their private homes. While the above passage clarifies that it is considered disrespectful to display his photograph to the public, regarding postings on other websites the Baha'i World Center has written, For Baha'is, the photograph of Baha'u'llah is very precious and it should not only be viewed but also handled with due reverence and respect, which is not the case here on a non-Baha'i website. Thus, it is indeed disturbing to Baha'is to have the image of Baha'u'llah treated in such a disrespectful way. However, as the creator of the site is not a Baha'i, there is little, if anything, that can be done to address this matter. We hope these comments have been of assistance. Topic. See also Apostles of Baha'u'llah Comparison of the founders of religious traditions List of founders of major religions Baha'i orthography Topic. References Topic. Footnotes Topic. Explanatory notes Topic. Works cited Topic. External links BBC Religion and Ethics Special, Baha'i. The Life of Baha'u'llah, a Photographic Narrative Light to the World, a film about the life of Baha'u'llah and the impact of his teachings Baha'u'llah, Manifestation of God, Biography from Baha'i.org A Brief Biography of Baha'u'llah, from University of Michigan Department of History The Works of Baha'u'llah, Writings of Baha'u'llah in English, Persian and Arabic Works by Baha'u'llah at Project Gutenberg Works by or about Baha'u'llah at Internet Archive Works by Baha'u'llah at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks